Right, nearly there with this thing. So left to do is two of these and they look like this for a reason. If we look at the assembly and section view, it's done with this taper so that there's some meat around the end of the thread here. You can make it with just a square edge boss, but then you only have a little thin web of material left at this end to support the bracket in order to have enough space around this thread. Or you make the bracket thicker, and I want to keep the thickness of this bracket to a minimum so that we're not offsetting the follow rest too much. Now you'll see in the design here that I've deliberately got clearance in the taper because I'm going to rely on this flat face to do the clamping. Don't have to, you could make it so that the taper does the clamping, but this is just an easy way of doing it. Let's have a quick look at making these custom bolts and then we'll get into the assembly and testing of this device. And away we go. First of all, applying some Sharpie to the OD of the part. And that just makes it very easy to see when I'm very lightly touching off with the tool. And then a facing cut. And having established those, that sets my Z or Z zero position. And I can program the DRO with the OD of the part. So now I've got the drawing up in the corner here just as a reference. Um, so you can look at that as I go through machining this part. I do like using full flood coolant, especially on stainless steel, which is what this is. This is 304 stainless steel. A couple of light cuts and then moving to 100 thou depth of cut which is really easy with these inserts. So now what I'm doing first is turning two diameters. The smaller diameter I'm working on now will be used to make the thread for the bolt. And then there will be a shoulder diameter a turn, which will be used to make the taper. So the shoulder diameter will be at the major diameter of the taper. I'm using these Kenner Metal CNMG 432MS inserts. These were given to me by a machinist to try and they are really excellent all round inserts. They're especially good on stainless steel um, but they work really well on mild steel as well. I can take much bigger cuts than 100 thou with these when I need to. So with the two diameters turned, what I'm now going to do is use the compound, which was set to the angle in the drawing. And all I'm going to do is whittle away at that shoulder until the angle meets both the large diameter face and the smaller diameter, which is used to make the thread. This taper does not need to be super accurate. It's really just to provide reinforcement for the bolt. So this is perfectly easy way of doing it. Now just a clean up chamfer. And because I happen to have one, we're just very, very boringly cutting the thread with a die, rather than single pointing it, which would have been a lot more interesting. Now a quick look at putting the hex features on. Very simple, just over to the mill, in the spin dexer, touched off on the end of the part just to establish a zero location. Now touching off on a Sharpie mark diameter again just to get a height location. 
and then it's a matter of milling the flats, turning the spindex around and continuing until complete. Back at the lathe. Thought I'd try a new angle here and see if we could get up close and personal. Seems to be working quite well, although we'll probably get cooling all over ourselves. So here we are just parting off this special bolt. Half the speed I usually turn at is my rule of thumb. Coolant and or lubricant makes it go very well. Now you can see I've got pieces of soft copper in the jaws here just to protect it and I've turned it round. It's very wobbly, so just using a push bar to straighten it out. Turn the nub off. And then get in there carefully with a center drill. Followed by the tapping drill. and then tapping by hand. Haven't managed to convince myself to try power tapping yet. This is just a quick look at some of the process of making the brass end knob. And really it's just turning to an OD, drilling out the bulk of the material, and then boring to a close fit size. There's a little cross hole uh, in this part which I did off camera and that's used to lock it onto the actuator shaft using the uh, little actuator lever. And here I'm just parting it off and as usual using a brass rod to catch it. And turning around, facing and chamfering clean. Right, here's the parts of the lock. Main bracket here. Actuator shaft here. Now I didn't show the assembly of this because it's a big brass knob, kind of chunky looking thing, and a lever. Lever just screws through into the shaft. And there's a little counter bore there just for a flat surface for that to seat on. So nothing, nothing untoward. And then uh, Here's our cam. Yeah. So the screw is sub flush everywhere. So that can't score the cross slide. And the head of the screw is the high point of the cam. And the lever is down when the cam is up. So it'll be like that on the machine when you actuate it like this. So let's get it on the lathe, see how it works. Filming from above, I'm going to see if I can show the cam actuating. You see it just come out there. There we go. So we'll just take a look around it. So as you can see in the off position, the lever is down and nicely out of the way. The brass knob, which honestly isn't even needed, is just the right size any bigger and it would interfere. So to actuate it, just bring this up like that. It's 
It's nice and tight. So I'm going to go in 50 thou, no lock. Lock is off, on, off. All right, 50, 55 thou. And starting the automatic feed. With no lock and only a light cut, you can see how the cross slide is pushed. With heavier cuts and larger diameter parts, the effect is even more dramatic. Okay, now I'll go in 50 thou again. Uh, this time I'll engage the lock. Oh. Now you can see even at a hundred thou depth of cut, the lock is quite happy. See how the surface finish is much better. Getting the insert to a point where it's working properly. Ah, oh, that's enough. So there you are, that's uh, a demonstration of the whole point of the lock. Um, even at twice the depth of cut without the lock, the cross slide doesn't budge. So that's a win. And as you can see, to activate the lock and deactivate it, your hands are well back here, out of the way of everything that's going on. So, very successful test, uh, very successful modification. Oh, another one. Shoo, shoo, shoo. You gotta watch out for those things. Don't let them take hold in your workshop. If you're not careful, they'll turn into marauding gangs of Quality Street. Now then, the follow rest. I need to shorten the screws for this, which I have not done yet, but just to give you an idea how this works. It's just uh, mounts to the threads on the two custom bolts that were made earlier on. And to keep everything within a reasonable span, um, the bolts have kind of a minimum thread depth. So I have to shorten uh, these two mounting bolts. So
This will not be tight because I can't screw the bolts all the way in. I've got to take off about 150 or 200,000. You can see that's still loose. But just to give you an idea, obviously take off enough and then that head will be sub flush. And then that will be held tight. So put a tool on here. Now I usually try and run the machine with the compound back flush against the edge of the way there, which it just makes sense for maximum rigidity. When I'm running the steady rest, that's usually a lighter cut job anyway. So all I've really got to do is move the compound over just a little bit to get the support full support of the steady rest. So I'm only about a half to three quarters of an inch uh, over the way. So that I think is a nice modification. I'm very happy with it. Uh, it does the job, holds the cross slide, stops any slack from the backlash coming into play. Um, keeps my hands back out of the way of any parts being machined or the chuck or whatever and still allows use of the follow rest without removing the cross slide lock. So I call that a win. So with that, thank you very much for following along. I hope you found this useful. If you would like detailed drawings of this assembly, then send me an email, which I will put on the screen about now. And uh, if you would like a sticker, contact me at the same email address. Um, but if you'd like a set of drawings, contact me there and I will send you a set free of charge in PDF form. Um, that's perfectly fine. Just bear in mind that you are almost certainly going to have to adjust some dimensions to suit your machine, unless you happen to have one of these. Uh, and I'm sure there are a number of other brands that have uh, similar spacings, but consider the drawings a sort of starting point. You may have to adjust to suit your machine. And with that, all the very best wherever you are in the world. Stay safe and well and happy. Hope everything's going well for you. And look forward to having you along for more Shed Nanigans next time. Bye for now.